Hello, everyone. Welcome on behalf of the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America. I'm Kathleen Brown, Director of Programs for the MGFA. We want to first thank Alexion for their generous support of MGFA patient service programs, and in particular, the MGFA webinars. We're proud to offer this program, MG Drugs in Development, one of the MGFA's series of webinars. We're pleased to present our speaker, Robert Ross, MD, PhD, Immediate Past Chairman of the MGFA Medical Scientific Advisory Board, retired Chief of Neurology at the Cleveland VA Medical Center, and National Director of Neurology for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Dr. Ruff is a professor of neurology and neurosciences at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. And I'd, I'm happy to uh, present James Howard, MD, distinguished professor of neuromuscular disease, professor of neurology, medicine, and allied health, chief of neurological, of neuromuscular, sorry, disorder section, North Carolina School of Medicine. Dr. Ruff will give an overview of current and recent drug studies being done for myasthenia gravis, and Dr. Howard will report on Solaris, also known as eculizumab. I'm going to talk for a moment about housekeeping points. We ask that all of you mute either your phone or your computer. Please do not have both speakers on because it causes feedback that is heard by everyone and, and can ruin. Uh, we ask uh, if, you're, if you have a question, you can type it into the chat box, which you will see at the lower right of your screen. Uh, depending on the question, we may answer some as we go along, but in general, we'll, we'll tend to hold them towards the end. Uh, we, you know, we might unmute participants at the end, but I'm not sure if that will work or not. So keep that in mind, and once, once the presentations are done, we'll try it and see whether it works. If there are problems with feedback, we will go back to mute and continue to use the chat box. I want to thank you all for joining the program. I hope you get a lot out of it. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bob Ruff. Hello and, and welcome. This is uh, really an exciting time. Um, the uh, presentation that we're going to give you is going to cover a number of, of new, um, new treatments for myasthenia gravis, and the number is dramatically increased compared to the recent past. Uh, as you know, the MGFA is a nonprofit dedicated to patients with myasthenia gravis and their families. And um, the, the presentation is going to talk about what causes disease in myasthenia gravis, the importance of CD20 class of D, lymph, D lymphocytes, and complement in myasthenia gravis. Um, two of the treatments that we're going to talk about are monoclonal antibodies. If you see a drug name that has MAB after it, not the brand name, but the actual uh, technical name, uh, the MAB stands for monoclonal antibodies. A small peptide that can bind to a protein and block its function. Uh, clinical trials on uh, Rituximab, which is a monoclonal antibody treatment that attacks CD20 cells, and Eculizumab uh, that targets uh, a key element in the complement pathway. Complement is a chemical system that causes uh, damage uh, in response to antibodies binding. Um, a small peptide that uh, talks about that uh, blocks the C5 element of complement, and uh, a number of preclinical treatment strategies. Th these are strategies that are uh, in the preclinical phase but are uh, approaching um, clinical implementation. Uh, at 
the neuromu normal neuromuscular junction, the nerve uh, sends a chemical signal uh, via acetylcholine that binds to the um, acetylcholine receptors here. These receptors uh, produce a, a current that travels a short distance to the area at the bottom of these clefts where the sodium channels are, and the sodium channels then carry an electrical signal down the muscle that stimulates the muscle to contract. The um, acetylcholine uh, receptor induced current can be thought of as a, uh, a fuse that ignites the um, electrical, um, the large electrical current that travels up and down the muscle uh, to trigger contraction. In the case of myasthenia gravis, um, in the most common form, the acetyl, where there's antibodies directed against the acetylcholine receptor, the antibodies bind to the receptor, and the binding um, triggers uh, complement activation, and the complement causes destruction of the acetylcholine receptors as well as adjacent membranes so that this whole area gets, uh, is severely damaged. Um, and uh, here again is just a cartoon version. The acetylcholine receptor current goes down, stimulates the sodium channels uh, shown over here. Uh, and that stimulates something called an action potential that travels up and down the muscle. Without the action potential traveling uh, along the muscle surface, you wouldn't get muscle contraction. So if the end plate current is too small or it, it, it's not large enough to trigger the uh, sodium channels to produce an action potential, you get uh, weakness to paralysis. What happens with myasthenia gravis is that you lose acetylcholine receptors. You also lose sodium channels. And probably as importantly, you get destruction and disruption of the membrane at the muscle surface, which um, uncouples the, the connection between the acetylcholine receptors and the sodium channels. The end plate current is too small to trigger an action potential, and you don't get um, you don't get muscle contraction. Um, repeated contractions produce more of a strain on the system, and so patients with myasthenia gravis tend to develop weakness with repeated activity, and this um, fatigability is also something that is uh, studied in electrical testing. Uh, very briefly, there are two types of lymphocytes. T lymphocytes, which are involved in uh, cellular immunity and in regulating B lymphocytes. The B lymphocytes are the ones that produce the antibodies, so they are involved in something called humoral uh, immune responses, that is, uh, immune disorders associated with um, antibody production. And in myasthenia gravis, there have clearly been antibodies direct discovered that act by uh, attacking acetylcholine receptor or other key elements at the neuromuscular junction. Uh, in particular for myasthenia gravis, the CD20 class of B lymphocytes uh, have been strongly associated with disease progression. Again, there, this slide is simply to illustrate there are different types of autoimmune diseases. Uh, some of uh, the T cells um, are pathogenic, and in the case of myasthenia gravis, it's the antibodies producing pathogen, it's the B cells producing pathogenic antibodies that is uh, the important factor with the disease. Uh, T cells um, regulate the activity of the uh, B cells, and in some cases, 
people have looked at uh, modulating T cell activity in order to, to turn down uh, B cell induced antibody production. Complement is a, a key factor. Uh, this is a, a cartoon showing that when an antibody binds to a cell, that that triggers a chemical cascade that results in the production of um, destructive uh, chemicals that are referred to as membrane attack complex. These bind to the, in the case of myasthenia gravis, you get antibody binding. The antibody binding to the acetylcholine receptors triggers or activates the complement cascade, and that results in uh, severe damage to the end plate membrane with loss of acetylcholine receptors, other proteins, and uh, also sodium channels. So it, the pathophysiology of myasthenia gravis, it's the CD20 class of B cells that produce the antibodies that bind to the acetylcholine receptor or other key elements. Uh, the antibodies can disrupt protein function. Uh, that's what appears to be going on in the anti-musk form of uh, myasthenia gravis. And the antibodies can activate complement, and the complement activation seems to be uh, a very important part of the damage that's induced by antibodies in the acetylcholine receptor um, form of myasthenia gravis, that is the form where there are uh, detectable antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. The complement destroys, and as I said before, the complement destroys the target protein or the acetylcholine receptor and surrounding membranes uh, with the key protein. Uh, key element in it. Uh, I don't expect you to um, take this slide in fully other than to appreciate that there are many ways to activate the complement system and that a key step involves C5 or the fifth element in the complement pathway that uh, undergoes a change, and the change in C5 uh, results in activation of this membrane attack complex. Um, inactivating or uh, turning off C5 stops the uh, activation of the membrane attack complex and stops the damage induced by um, complement. Uh, and again, with respect to the B cells, the, the classes refer to the type of surface markers that the uh, B cells have on them. The CD20 class of B cells are implicated in uh, myasthenia gravis uh, and also in multiple sclerosis. And this class of antibody, this uh, class of B cell, is targeted by um, rituximab, which is uh, used, um, which is a drug produced by uh, Biogen um, and is being studied for myasthenia gravis. Ocrelizumab uh, is an agent that's being studied for multiple sclerosis. Both of these target the pathogenic uh, class of B cells. Uh, that's pathogenic in myasthenia gravis. Um, and rituximab binds to the CD20 um, marker site or uh, surface uh, protein site. Uh, it and then it, it in turn uh, targets this cell, the CD20 B lymphocyte, for destruction. And so by uh, binding to it and activating complement, uh, this monoclonal antibody is able to um, destroy, uh, specifically destroy CD20 um, uh, 
lymphocytes. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk just very briefly about the rituximab study, and then I'll turn the slides over to Dr. Howard. Um, in terms of expertise in this area, Dr. Howard's been involved with studies of rituximab, studies of eculizumab. Uh, he's uh, acting as an advisor for uh, the small peptide that will be discussed uh, and others. So he's got a large amount of, of experience in clinical trials in this area. Um, Rituximab has been studied. There are a number of studies of rituximab uh, with uh, Formiostenia gravis. One was a multi-site study um, looking at the use of rituximab for patients with musk myasthenia gravis. Um, and uh, another study uh, that was presented in JAMA um, focused on the um, prolonged uh, effect, the durability of effect of um, <clears throat> using rituximab to target the CD20 class of cells. Note that both of these studies came out in 2017, so this is really uh, very recent and um, ongoing research. Uh, rituximab has been uh, FDA approved for the treatment of uh, certain types of B cell uh, cancers uh, since it destroys a specific class of B, um, B lymphocytes or beta lymphocytes. <coughs> uh, it's being considered uh, for approval for um, myasthenia gravis. I'll, I'll turn the slides over to uh, Dr. Howard now. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Bob, and thanks to the foundation for putting this on, and a good day to everyone uh, for joining. The first topic I want to highlight is that of complement inhibition uh, in myasthenia. This is not a new concept. In fact, there were very elegant studies done by Dr. Andrew Engel at the Mayo Clinic in the mid-1970s and towards the end of the 1970s, where he was able to demonstrate that there were differences in the topography or the architecture, if you will, of the neuromuscular junction, much like Bob showed you in that cartoon, that these post-junctional folds, uh, whose purpose is to allow more receptor to be present, and increase what we call the safety factor were destroyed. And in parallel with that, uh, demonstrated that there was indeed immunoglobulin, presumably antibody at the time, as well as fragments of complement there at the neuromuscular junction. And in subsequent studies that were around 1978, 79, 1980, Vanda Lennon at Mayo Clinic in my laboratory at the University of Virginia, were able to block the development of an experimental model of myasthenia. She, through active immunization of rats and mice with, with components of the receptor, and I was taking human serum and passively transferring it to these animals. But if we blocked the complement system using um, the toxin from uh, snakes, cobra snakes, we could preserve and not induce the experimental uh, disease. And then it sat. Uh, we didn't know what to do with it. And over the years, various investigators have looked at the role of different components of, um, of um, uh, different components of, of complement and what its role was in developing experimental myasthenia. Ten years ago, uh, this month, we sat down with, uh, the, with Pharma, Alexion, and began discussions about a possible role, therapeutic role, of inhibiting complement in myasthenia. And it's been a ten-year odyssey. Um, after lots of trial development and trying to design 
a proof of concept trial, a phase two trial was um, begun um, in the first decade of 2000. It was completed around 2011 or so, where we looked at 14 patients and gave half of them a uh, drug and half of them uh, saline, essentially, and then crossed them over. And surprisingly, uh, the improvement was substantial, way beyond what we anticipated. And because of that, um, the discussion and ultimate development of this large phase three trial with eculizumab uh, began. Um, this trial on which a lot of this is based on um, involved 125 patients in about 92 countries in practically every continent of the world. Uh, so literally hundreds of investigator teams uh, and, and patients were involved. Uh, as are all studies nowadays, this was randomized. So uh, half the patients received an active drug, half the patients received no drug at all, but a, a saline salt solution. And then we investigated them over the course of 26 weeks. And following that, patients had the option to participate in what we call an open label extension trial uh, in which they knew they were on active drug. And uh, to its credit, 117 of those 125 patients elected to participate. Um, and we now have very substantial data through 52 weeks of total therapy. And in December, we'll make another data cut and so we'll add another, uh, I think it's 15, 18 months uh, to our experience. Um, the drug was highly successful. Uh, not everybody got better. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there is a, a portion of patients who uh, do not respond or do not respond well, but it can be transformative in patients uh, who otherwise had failed therapy. Now, who participated in this trial? These were individuals who had failed at least two immune suppressant drugs, prednisone, azathioprine, the cyclosporin, tacrolimus, uh, mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, over the course of more than a year. Or they could have failed one of those drugs, uh, but were requiring chronic plasma exchange or IVIG uh, to maintain some semblance of improvement. So these are the folks who uh, had not done well, had a fairly significant disease burden. Um, and when we look at their characteristics, uh, it was clear that they had fairly active disease that was not responding uh, to the management strategies of their physicians. Um, they, in, compared to other patients with the disease had more hospitalizations, more intensive care stays. Um, many more of them had been on a ventilator at some time during the course of their illness um, and may have had intolerable side effects to some drug uh, during their odyssey of treatment. Uh, the data was, was analyzed and it was clear that in all of the domains that we used as markers for improvement, there was improvement. Um, numbers of statistical analyses were performed and these were, uh, 22 of them in fact, were developed even before we put the first patient in the trial. So we had these pre-specified what we call outcome measures that would allow us to look at whether these were efficacious uh, or not. Um, the, they all met the bar, so to speak. Um, there was one statistical analysis that was done originally uh, in, in terms of looking at the change in the, of the scoring system um, that took into account people who dropped out of the study for whatever reason and there were originally four patients who did so. One, because their myasthenia worsened, but three for reasons that had nothing to do with the drug or the study. Cancer of the prostate, bowel issues because of their prednisone, 
uh, in an infection that was unrelated. Yet, because they had to leave the study, uh, their scoring system, even though th all those three were tremendously improved, they sort of went to the bottom of the pile. And so one of the statistical measures was not uh, impressive at all. Um, be that as it may, the 18 of the other 22 were very impressive. And as you all know that uh, a week ago, uh, Monday, the FDA approved the drug for use uh, in generalized myasthenia gravis. In August, August 21, I think it was, or August 16, the EMA, the European Medical uh, Association, approved the drug for patients with refractory uh, myasthenia. Um, and so we now have uh, labeling both in the US and both in, in Europe. And the drug will be launched initially in Europe and Germany and we're already moving through um, insurance company discussions, et cetera, to start using it here in the U.S. as of uh, last week. Uh, we're still waiting to hear from Japan as to whether um, uh, they're going to approve it uh, as well. What you see on this slide is um, another uh, molecule. Interesting because we're not seeing the slides advance. Uh, I haven't advanced any slides. Can you see this? Sorry slide? about that. Um, yeah. What you see here is a protein peptide that was developed by another company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, called Raw Pharmaceuticals, uh, which also binds to this portion of complement called C5. Um, it is different in construction from eculizumab. Eculizumab is administered by intravenous infusion uh, once a week for five weeks till we ramp up to maximum dose. And then uh, following that, it's administered every two weeks uh, thereafter. This molecule here, which doesn't have a name yet other than this um, number, uh, will be administered by subcutaneous injection once a day, much like you're giving yourself an insulin shot. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to both approaches and exactly what the benefits uh, will be, what the issues will be, and side effects is yet to be determined. This drug uh, will go to clinical trial within the next couple of weeks. Uh, the initial plan is to look at uh, somewhere around 30 to 40 patients. There will be about 13 centers uh, uh, in the U.S. and maybe two in, in Europe. And depending upon how that goes, the decision will be made whether we go to a greater, what we call a, a pivotal regulatory uh, trial, much like we did with eculizumab uh, recently. It has some advantages in that uh, some Japanese patients have a genetic change that doesn't allow eculizumab to do its job. Uh, it's a very small number, uh, and this drug will uh, bind to a different spot on this complement protein C5 and should be efficacious in, in this population. Um, so these trials with this product are just starting to get underway. Um, and as Bob's already showed you, we're targeting C5, and I think the take-home message here is that C5 is cleaved by an enzyme into C5B, and this then starts this whole cascade of events um, that creates this membrane attack complex, and since the FDA made its decision, it's now called terminal complement complex. Um, that destroys tissue. Uh, think of it like a donut laying on top and inside that donut it drills a hole through your membrane and then various ions and chemicals can pass through and, and kill the cell. So we're going to block this downstream process. Because this C5 portion of complement is what we call the terminal portion of complement, 
we preserve all of the other activities of complement, those activities that fight and clear bacterial infections, viral infections, fungal infections, etc. All of that remains intact and um, um, is preserved in patients who receive this drug. Uh, the eculizumab drug has been in, in use now for about uh, pushing 20 years, first in clinical trials and then subsequently since 2007 to treat a disease called paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria or PNH. Uh, and then in 2013 for another ultra rare disorder called atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. And so we have uh, 10 to 15, 16 years of experience uh, in terms of safety and effect, uh, et cetera. And I'll speak about that uh, in a minute. Um, so this was the trial. It was published um, last uh, week in, in Lancet Neurology. And if you Google it, you'll be able to read the, the um, uh, synopsis of, of that trial. Um, in terms of, um, in, and this is the other uh, drug that's produced by raw pharmaceuticals, and we have no data at this point in time uh, for a myasthenic patient. We have normal volunteers, uh, and it's well tolerated, but we have no uh, disease data uh, yet. So there's not much more I can tell you uh, about that. Just as a way of disclosure, I consult for a number of these companies, including Alexion and Ra, and two that you'll hear about uh, are Genix and Torenza. Um, and I do it uh, for gratis because I'm intimately involved in the clinical trial programs as we develop them. Um, before we leave uh, a compliment, let's just talk about safety. Uh, by blocking C5, we uh, place individuals at risk for one kind of a particular infection, um, and that's called those that are, are um, created by what's called an encapsulated bacteria, uh, the most common of which is a, a, a bug called Neisseria. And you've probably heard of Neisseria meningitides. Uh, and all college students now are vaccinated uh, for this uh, bacteria because it can run rampant in college dorms, etc. And so all patients who receive a complement inhibitor are vaccinated actually with two different vaccines to uh, help minimize the risk of developing a Neisseria infection and most importantly, a Neisseria meningitis. Through the course of the last uh, 10, 12 years, there have been five cases of Neisseria meningitis, all treated uh, successfully, and they were in the PNH trial. We did not see any of these infections in the myasthenia trial, and we've now had patients on active drug for uh, pushing four years uh, as of uh, this November. Um, the drug is otherwise well tolerated. Our most common complaint is some musculoskeletal aching. Some patients developed a runny nose, some developed a sore throat, and these are in very, very low percentages. Um, but a little more than 10% of patients had some musculoskeletal uh, discomfort that would labeled by the investigators as mild, and a few said it was a little bit more than mild. So an extremely well uh, tolerated product despite being administered every two weeks by IV uh, infusion. And no one uh, developed uh, these uh, infections that were, we are concerned about. But by the same token, we don't take that lightly, and hence the immunization. Patients are given safety cards they carry in their wallet, so any healthcare provider can be brought up to date with 800 numbers to company experts if there's difficulty. Let's change gears here for a minute and uh, talk about an, an, an emerging product. Uh, one is uh, their two, uh, what we call uh, uh, fetal uh, FC receptor molecules. And there are two companies involved. One is UCB Pharma, 
Um, and the other is a company from Belgium called Argenex. Um, both drugs are in clinical trial at the moment. They're still in active trial, so we do not have any data whatsoever. And what the purpose of this molecule is, is to bind circulating antibody and bring it in to the, into the cell and then destroy it, and then go back out and recirculate and recapture uh, again. And this is shown um, by, if I can get the pointer here to work, and it's hiding on me, so I can't. Uh, but if you look at the right side of the slide, and there it comes. Great, thank you. Uh, in this region, we go out, we grab onto the antibody, we bring it in to what's called lysosomes, which are internal portions of the cell that can eat things up and spit it out. And then it goes out and recycles uh, again. And when we look at normal volunteers and look at IgG uh, levels, immunoglobulin levels of which antibodies are made, then we see there's this rapid reduction here in green, where in the normals it stays this way. And so one can look at this as a potential substitute perhaps for plasma exchange, uh, for IVIG, uh, et cetera. Um, just how effective it is, we don't know. Uh, the last patients in the initial Argenix trial are finishing up, and then we'll be looking at at all of the data. I'm not working with UCB, so I don't know uh, where their trial is other than to know that it's underway. Their molecule is a little bit different in its construction, but is essentially doing uh, the same thing. So uh, another new targeted therapy. And as we speak, you'll hear the word this targeted therapy over and over. And I think that becomes important because I believe that targeted therapies are going to have much narrower side effect profiles than our current treatment strategies with prednisone and imuran and mycophenolate cell set, uh, the cyclosporins, etc. cetera. Um, interestingly, uh, and to give you some background, is that we know that infants born to moms who have myasthenia have the potential in 10% 12, 15% of developing a transient form of myasthenia. That comes on after delivery, hours after delivery, and then uh, lasts a few weeks, sometimes a bit longer, and then goes away. And it's due to the fact that mom's antibody has affected the child. Well, then the question should be, well, if that's the case, why isn't the child affected in utero? They develop profound weakness and they get into complications and, and die in utero. And it relates, and, and rarely that can occur, but it relates to the fact that during pregnancy, there is a protein that's called alpha fetoprotein uh, that circulates in very high levels. And it does two things. One, it actually blocks the binding of antibody to the receptor and prevents the mom's myasthenic antibody from doing its thing. And it also actually modulates the immune system to some degree. And there is a Canadian company, uh, Alpha Cancer Technologies, uh, who is developing this product. It's still in the think tank in the experimental animal stage at this point uh, as they do their due diligence. I have no idea when it will come to clinical trial at this point. Um, but clearly, when it's given to, to animals who are developing myasthenia and don't receive it, they actually get uh, sick. And if we do uh, give it, um, they can preserve and, and not develop uh, myasthenia. And these are in, in mouse. Um, so again, it's a novel approach. Uh, it uh, may have a therapeutic role in, in managing our patients, um, but we're still very early uh, in the game uh, to know exactly how this is going to come about. The group in Pennsylvania, Dr. Lindstrom, <clears throat> has taken parts of the receptor and using the side, the portion that's inside the cell, he's made what's called a vaccine. It's not truly a vaccine. But um, uh, simplistically, 
it functions like a vaccine. And in his experimental animals, he's able to uh, inhibit the development of, um, of myasthenia gravis. Um, and he has some other laboratory studies uh, that support that in what we call cell culture. Um, it, again, a very novel, this is parts of the receptor that do not see antibody yet can inhibit uh, the, the, the disease itself. He's in the process of scaling this up uh, to larger animal models and from there we'll go to human clinical trial. And again, we don't know when th this will occur, um, but John has had uh, several decades of experience in the myasthenia world dating to the mid 70s and um, uh, this is something he's very passionate about and we'll hear more about that uh, in, the, in the months to come. Another one that I want to speak about and this is a very small biotech company in, in Sweden and I consult for this company uh, who have taken an interesting approach where they've taken pieces of the acetylcholine receptor, they have attached it to um, a killed portion of a cholera bacteria. I mean, that's a bacteria that can give you bad diarrhea and things like that. Well, they've, they've inhibited all of that bad stuff, um, but have attached the, these receptor components to it as well as, um, as, well as some uh, other manipulations, if you will, of the protein and can re reset the immune system. We call this tolerization. The problem in myasthenia is that uh, our neuromuscular junctions are there. They're normal. There shouldn't be anything wrong with them, but the body has misidentified them as not being uh, us. Uh, much like if someone got a transplant, a kidney transplant, heart, whatever, the body instantly knows that it's not its heart or its kidney and tries to reject it. And that's what's going on in MG. The body is rejecting the neuromuscular junction. Um, and this resets the immune system so that this um, rejection uh, discontinues. And so the hope would be that a brief exposure to this would reset the immune system and the disease would go away. Um, ideally, indefinitely, I don't know if that's possible, uh, but for a prolonged period of time. And so <clears throat> this group has done all of their preclinical work and they're now trying to scale up to start uh, clinical trials sometime within the next uh, two, three years. Um, so it's one that we're going to watch very closely um, uh, and, and very carefully. Um, and this is just to show that that their uh, myasthenic animals, when they're given this through the nose, they simply snort it. They actually put it in a little um, squeeze bottle and squirt it up their nose that the ability uh, to get weak, and this is more weakness up here on this side of the scale versus minimal or no weakness following treatment in the experimental animals and the use of this drug uh, produces this substantial improvement. Um, again, as I said, very, very exciting. Um, before, I guess, um, do you want to continue on, Bob, or? Yeah, so I was just going to say that um, we've talked about a number of, of very exciting um, treatments, and as uh, Dr. Howard said, these are what's happening in terms of the treatments is that we're not looking at globally um, suppressing the immune system as would occur when you give uh, treatments like uh, prednisone and some other immunosuppressant agents. We're looking to target the treatment. Uh, to the part of the immune system that is uh, responsible for causing disease and myasthenia. Uh, again, as Dr. Howard said, to try and um, work, uh, work a 
as specifically as possible to have as few unwanted side effects as possible. Um, the rituximab is a, an agent that came out of, was not designed for myasthenia gravis. It was designed to treat um, lymphomas associated with um, a specific class of B cells, the CD20 class of B cells. And it turned out that those that class of B cells was important for myasthenia gravis and possibly also for multiple sclerosis. So um, rituximab was not designed for, but may be very efficacious for myasthenia gravis. Eculizumab was not designed for uh, myasthenia gravis. It was initially used in, in other complement-related disorders. But as Dr. Howard said, by working with the company, uh, was able to uh, he was able to con convince or enlighten them as to the applicability of their uh, monoclonal antibody for treating myasthenia gravis. Uh, the peptide, the small peptide that RA101495, um, was not designed to treat myasthenia gravis, it, or it was designed towards other complement-associated diseases. Uh, so where the MGFA is involved in trying to help you is to, to not, not only uh, conduct clinical trials, but also to get uh, companies that are developing new agents uh, interested in applying their agents to myasthenia gravis when they might be applicable. Um, rituximab is a, is a wonderful agent, as is eculizumab. Uh, and, and as was mentioned, eculizumab has recently been FDA approved. Um, the, there's a, I just wanted to mention also that, that Catalyst uh, Pharmaceuticals, which makes an agent, uh, amsampradine, which acts in a manner similar to mestinon in terms of increasing uh, acetylcholine uh, availability. Um, and for those of you on the call who have the musk form of myasthenia gravis, uh, mestinon is not useful for musk. In fact, many some patients get worse when musk is used. But the amphampridine acts in a slightly different way and has not been shown uh, in animal studies to exacerbate the musk MG, and so it may be interesting for those on the call who have um, musk MG to uh, dial in or, or uh, go into the webinar that that company is going to present to see if you might be interested in participating in a, in a clinical trial. Um, the, the science is clearly taking off. Uh, People like uh, Dr. Howard are helping it move forward by uh, working with companies to develop drug studies, uh, develop clinical trials. Uh, these are that's no uh, trivial uh, task to do that. I mean, I don't know how many co countries it was. It was something like uh, it was uh, 17 countries, I think. Uh, and the only continent I know you didn't have was Antarctica. And I don't think there are many people who live in Antarctica, so you couldn't really do a study there. But otherwise, it was in the United States, Europe, South America, Asia. Uh, I don't know if you had a site in Africa, but I would suspect you probably did. Uh, so uh, we're, we're working to try and... and advance the treatment. And this was true for Dr. Uh, Howard. I also am uh, an advisor for, uh, for a couple of drug companies, but I do so uh, without pay because I don't want to be uh, in the pay of a pharmaceutical company because I want the allegiance to be solely to the patient. Uh, and we are open for questions, I guess, unless you wanted to say something else. Uh, just a couple of points. Um, in terms of complement in inhibition, it targets immunoglobulin, 
that is what we call um, IgG one in three. Uh, it's what the molecule is made out of. It does not work in musk, um, and uh, because that's of an IgG4 subclass, and complement doesn't bind to that group. Um, what I will also say, just looking at some of the questions that are feeding in, um, this drug was approved by the FDA for patients who have antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor, who have generalized disease, not restricted ocular disease, and there will be a component in place by insurance companies that will limit its use because of its cost uh, to those who have failed uh, certain or degrees of, of therapy, if you will. Um, unlike the European approval, the FDA has approved it for a receptor positive generalized uh, weakness, but I think um, uh, the insurance companies in the sky are going to control our lives in terms of that. There were questions about uh, would it be used in LRP4 agrin? Uh, those studies are not done. Um, there are theoretical possibilities that it could. Um, I don't know if insurance would pay for it at this point until those studies are done, uh, but that's under discussion for small trials to look at uh, that group. Um, and I guess we'll just open it for questions and try and, and sort through them. Someone asked. Hello, um, this is Kathy Brown. I'm, I'm just going to open the line to see whether uh, we can do this by voice rather than, no? We'll have to open everybody. Yeah, I know. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're going to just try and see whether it can be done by taking people off mute. But if it becomes overly noisy, we'll, we, or it's not working well, we'll go back to typing things in. Hang on one second while we take care of that. Okay, um, the lines are open if you'd like to voice your questions, um, and let's just see if this works. So I'd like to answer, question. I'd like to answer a question that uh, someone posed, whether with the use of these newer agents, can we get off current therapies? And the clinical trials are not addressing that at this point in time. Um, but as a clinician, it would be my expectation that I would try to minimize uh, the treatment to that which is most effective and, and if I were able to get someone off certain drugs, uh, I would clearly do that over a period of time. Um, someone asked how to get into clinical trials. Um, I think one is by uh, signing up for the MG registry. Um, that uh, MGFA has and hosted through the University of Alabama and Dr. Gary Cutter. That's a source of patient locations that pharma sometimes uses. It's also a way that as we search for patients, we can query and try and find folks. Using the MGFA website, <clears throat> we'll note trials. And then there's a website, it's called clinicaltrials.gov. So clinical trials is one word. All clinical trials and any disease have to be posted on this website. And so it behooves you just to periodically search and see what's on tap for, for MG. And there are a number of ways that you can search uh, by disease, location, et cetera. So that's a very useful uh, site to use. Um, Someone asked, are there any new prospects for the treatment of ocular myasthenia? Well, actually there are, um, there is one under discussion now uh, that relates to thymectomy in restricted ocular disease. It's still in the discussion development stage and hasn't moved beyond that. 
Um, there was a study with high-dose corticosteroids, the epitome trial, um, and that one was terminated early um, because of lack of recruitment. It used to be that patients uh, or myasthenia trials were the hardest to recruit for. They never filled, and it took uh, twice as long to get the number of patients that we wanted. And our experience in the uh, the Eculizumab trial with Alexion, the Argenix trial uh, that's currently going on, Argenix 113, is that we had no difficulty. We recruited ahead of time, so maybe the tides are, are changing, uh, which would be nice. Part of the difficulty is that uh, myasthenia affecting the younger population uh, for a percentage, it's pretty hard to, to be a mom, to be employed, and have, say, weekly visits to a study center uh, for a half a day or a, or a full day. And so um, that's a societal issue that we haven't addressed yet. So um, would anybody like to pose a question over the phone? Question. question. Yes. Double vision, anything to help, any recommendations? I have constant, the double vision is my biggest issue. Did, did, were you able to hear that? Yes. Yeah. So is there a clinical trial in, in relation to that? There's no specific trial for double vision. Um, we see this in our patients who are in any of our trials. It's one of the outcomes that we monitor to see what degree of improvement can occur, um, whether it be in ptosis or double vision or difficulty with speech, swallow, arm strength, leg strength. We have a number of tools that we use that allow us to, um, uh, to assess this, but there is no specific trial that focuses on double vision. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my experience is that uh, you need to work with a um, with a clinician who's used to trying some uh, different techniques, such as uh, alternate patching, um, in order to uh, allow the brain to not get too conflicting information. Uh, pieces of information about what it's seeing. Um, and that that works. It's important not to um, continue to, to obscure the vision from one specific eye, because that will uh, eventually lead to uh, impairment of vision from that eye. Um, but it, it, it's not. Um, it's not. It, it's very difficult to treat with um, with treatment because you can get a a you can get a significant improvement in strength, but unless it's perfect and until the or fixed, the uh, the slight difference in where the two eyes uh, focus or or uh, or the misalignment, the even slight misalignment of the two eyes results in the double vision. Um, that's why the uh, alternate patching um, often is the most effective, if, in, you know, provided you're able to tolerate it from a, from a cosmetic standpoint. Thank you. I see <laughs> Thanks. I see that some people are still typing in some questions and a few new ones have shown up. If you'd like to tackle, yeah, tackle a, One of the questions is, will CELSEP be approved by the FDA for, I assume, myasthenia gravis? Um, and I don't see that happening as an indication approval. It's already approved for other things and we use it off-label. Uh, we had uh, a bit of a struggle a year to two years ago when everyone was refusing to pay for it through the admirable efforts of the foundation along with Ted Burns at the University of Virginia. 
uh, cell sept was put on the microdex formulary and MG was listed as an indication. And with that, uh, virtually all of the payers have stopped hassling us and are approving it. So I would work with your physician to uh, have him uh, inform your insurance carrier through his letter of appeal uh, that it sits on this formulary, which is what most insurance companies use, and um, uh, it's being considered standard of care. There was a question about getting insurance companies, uh, dealing with insurance companies who won't pay for rituximab or eculizumab. Uh, the eculizumab has just been uh, recently approved. Um, I think that this is going to be a continual stri uh, struggle because of um, resistance to pay for treatments that while effective, are, um, are costly. I don't have any golden answer to that. Do you, do, you, do you, Dr. Howard? No, our lives are controlled, unfortunately, by the insurance companies, and we fight, and we often beat our heads against the wall. Um, but regrettably, uh, they sit in the driver's seat, um, unlike other healthcare systems in other parts of the world. Someone's asking whether the new meds are in the same group or family as what we're currently using. And no, each of the things that we've talked about today are very unique and novel uh, in terms of how they work, um, what they're acting upon, their side effect profiles, etc. Um, and as I said earlier, it's my belief that targeted therapies uh, that single out very specific regions uh, of the immune system will be better tolerated than those that are sort of blanket uh, control of the immune system. Now, that's not to say there are not side effects, and everybody is an individual, and one really won't know until one tries, um, and, and that's all one could really say about it. But they're all different. They all work by different means and they're completely different than what we're using now. So, um, anybody else? Uh, there was one question up, up the top about uh, plasmapheresis. Uh, it's a uh, it's a process whereby your blood is removed, um, the liquid portion is separated from the cell portion. The uh, liquid portion, including the antibodies, are uh, taken out, and uh, you're replaced with um, primarily albumin and the saline solution mixed with the, uh, the cells. Uh, some people don't tolerate the process well. Uh, some people have problems with uh, vascular access. Um, so it, it's, um, it, is, uh, it, it works for some people very well, but not for everybody. And I'm sorry you had a a bad reaction to it. Yep. There's another question about stem cell research from myasthenia gravis. Um, stem cells are used to um, or being considered for, uh, for example, to replace uh, tissue that is damaged. It's not really 
applicable for myasthenia gravis. Uh, I don't know how stem cell technology would be used in this disease. Uh, you would use it, for example, to try and replace damaged areas of the brain that it hasn't worked as yet in that, um, or to reconstruct organs. Um, I don't see that it would be possible to reconstruct a neuromuscular junction. So um, the question about immunotherapy, the treatments, the monoclonal antibody treatments uh, targeting CD20 cells are mono, are, is a form of immunotherapy. Um, some of the treatments that Dr. Howard discussed in terms of disease tolerance, uh, trying to reduce uh, antibody uh, binding are considered immunotherapies. Uh, or uh, act in a manner similar to immunotherapies. Um, and um, many of the treatments that are being used now were uh, applications to myasthenia of immunotherapies that had been used uh, for uh, treating immune system disorders, uh, including uh, cancers involving the immune system. Uh, I don't know that a bone marrow transplant would help. Um, it's, um, let me backtrack on that. Um, the idea that has been advanced um, by a few people, uh, but not with much success, is to totally um, destroy the immune system and then uh, replenish the bone marrow. Uh, the treatment is extremely drastic, and um, I myself have not had great experience with it. When I was in Seattle, there were a few uh, patients who were treated with that um, approach and did not do well. I don't know if you've had other experience, Dr. Howard. No, um, not as a therapeutic strategy. I've seen myasthenia develop after bone marrow transplantation for other disorders, and that's oh. well recognized. Um, if we could just hop back to your the stem cell question, there are actually eight patients who've been treated uh, in Canada uh, with uh, a stem cell transplant. Um, and these are patients who had failed other therapies um, they were improved. Um, it was a pretty rough go in terms of their hospitalization, duration of hospitalization. Uh, the data is very preliminary. We don't have any long-term data as to durability, uh, et cetera. But it has been tried in, in eight folks in the single uh, paper published in, in JAMA um, says that it was uh, effective. So that's all we know about it. Uh, the publication was back in 2016, so uh, it's still fairly new stuff. Um, so it's uh, about 7.11 now, and um, maybe we can take one or two more questions. Um, is there anybody that wants to put something out there? Well, I can I just that this information is going to be available on the MGFA website? Yes, it will be. Thank it may you. take us a few weeks to get it up there, but it will be there. Thank you. Uh, anybody want to comment on Mother Galena and uh, Nancy's and and Madeline? Maybe we can end it there. So uh, let me MG. go on, Bob. Um, so <laughs> there are two, there are two ways, a couple of answers to the question. Uh, the first is that um, for usual 
um, autoimmune myasthenia gravis, the condition is not directly hereditary, but there is a hereditary, can be a hereditary tendency towards autoimmune diseases. So people with myasthenia may be more prone to develop other autoimmune diseases. And if a person has a family history of, for example, an autoimmune thyroid disorder, they, due to a tendency, a her, an inherited tendency towards autoimmunity, may be more likely to develop myasthenia gravis. The other uh, thing is that uh, congenital disorders of neurologic, of neuromuscular transmission, uh, sometimes called congenital myasthenias, these are rare uh, conditions that usually manifest early in life, and these are um, associated with uh, inherited um, mutations affecting specific proteins in the neuromuscular junction, either at the nerve terminal, uh, within the neuromuscular junction itself, or on the muscle membrane. Uh, including the acetylcholine receptor, but not restricted to it. Uh, those rare disorders um, are uh, definitely hereditary. And let me just add that um, the hereditary aspect has been studied by NIH, and Dan Drachman headed it out of uh, Johns Hopkins, and many of us participated and about 1,300 Caucasians. Um, and Bob's right, there are genetic tendencies for autoimmunity that were identified. But interestingly, um, about 3% of the patients had a primary relative who had myasthenia. We had previously thought it was much rarer than that uh, and were surprised when we, we saw this many folks who had someone else in the family unit um, who had MG as well. But there is no specific gene, no specific gene that will cause uh, MG. So there, there's a question there from Nancy uh, asking about being excluded from MG trial. It's about the fourth one up from the bottom. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, there is inclusion and exclusion criteria. Well, each clinical trial has a list of what you have to have to get in and what you could have that takes you out. Remember that the cost of doing a clinical trial uh, is in the region of hundreds of millions of dollars, many hundreds of millions. And so a company essentially has one shot at making it work. And for that reason, whether it's right or wrong, uh, they try to get a pure population with very similar characteristics. The Alexion trial with Eculizumab, for instance, um, they had to have been receptor positive um, because we didn't know whether musk would improve or uh, double negatives would, would uh, improve, and you couldn't have had a tumor in the thymus gland. You could not have been on certain drugs within a certain period of time. You could not have had a thymectomy within a period of time. Um, and these are done to try and stack the odds for a favorable response so that things are not, quote, diluted out and we miss the, the signal. Now, the downside of that is that when insurance companies come along, they say, oh, we're only going to approve it for this because that was in the clinical trial. Um, and I think the FDA in part did us a favor by opening things up a little bit, did not mention prior uh, thymus pathology or thymectomy or certain drugs, et cetera. So that will help. What we as a community, uh, investigative community and companies have to do is now take these other subgroups and do smaller trials that will show that, that things are efficacious and hopefully be able to use that data to fight uh, big insurance companies 
uh, to um, allowing us to use it. But it is very frustrating for those who are seronegative or who have one antibody but not another. And, and as investigators, we hear you loud and clear. Um, but companies also have to protect uh, the ability to, to make something work. And, and so I see their side as well. But believe me, we sit in conferences as we develop the clinical trial, and it goes through innumerable iterations. Elizabeth took almost a year to write that clinical trial, uh, and it went through many arguments and late night discussions and face to face meetings to try and everyone agree on something that could possibly work. And in this particular instance, it paid off. Wow. Okay, um, this is Kathy. If you're okay with it, I, I will call this to a close. Okay. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us for MG Drugs in Development. And thanks so much, Bob Ruff, Chip Howard. We really, 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 really appreciate you taking the time and making the effort to share uh, on this webinar. I also want to thank Alexion again for their generous support of the program. Uh, and remind everybody that if you do want to revisit any of the content, you'll find the webinar posted on the MGFA website, myasthenia.org in coming weeks. And just FYI, you may want to join us again on Thursday, November 9th at 6 p.m. for Living Your Best Life with MG, uh, another webinar. Um, and there'll be a, a there was an announcement already, but we'll be sending out another announcement shortly. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. We really appreciate you taking time to do that. Thanks for all Thank of you, you for participating. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much.